All right, so um, one last type of filament. We have thick filament and we have fil thin filament, and then we have a type of filament that's called an elastic filament. And the elastic filament is basically going to be the structure that allows the forces that are induced between myosin and actin to be translated to other parts of the cell. So this is basically going to be uh, proteins that help anchor the sarcomere in place. The protein that we find here is a protein called titan. And this act, uh, protein titan acts as an anchor protein. Uh, and it helps to support and space out the myosin and the actin apart. <coughs> so this is where we're going to have our elastic filament helping to support the thin filament and then the thick filament so that they are going to be spaced out and kind of held in the right distance from each other. Yeah. So there's going to be a, an elastic filament on each side of the sarcomere? Yep, we're going to have elastic filaments um, on each side and also even really incorporated within. I, have, I think I have another spaces out. Spaces the myosin and the actin apart. That's not really mm. that great, is it? No. Oh, it's huge. So spaces the myosin and the actin apart. Now, when it comes down to the different filaments, and they're basically each filament is a different protein or a different group of protein that accomplish some sort of task. We can look at those filaments in the look at them from a uh, perspective of what they're doing. And when we do that, we really organize them into three different categories of function, functional categories. So the first functional category is going to be contractile proteins, and these are going to be the proteins that we find in the sarcomere, in the uh, myofibrils that are going to do the short. And the two that do the short name are myosin and actin. Can I ask a question real quick? You said there's three dots. Can you tell me what that is? Three dots, but it's still kind of. Of functional categories. Okay. And they're going to be contractile, regulatory, and accessory. So the contractile protein is the functional class, myosin and actin, and they just simply are going to do the short name of the contractile <laughs> proteins. And then we have regulatory proteins. In the regular protein, regulatory proteins are going to determine when a contraction is going to occur. And really, it's not that there's so much as determining it, but they are going to respond to the stimuli, the increase in calcium, and they have to function before the contractile proteins can actually function. So these are going to be uh, troponin and tropomyosin. So troponin and tropomyosin respond to calcium and help to regulate when actin active sites will be exposed so myosin can hook up and we can undergo contraction. That's supposed to be a four. Mm -hmm. 
And these are going to be accessory proteins. Will be our third functional group or functional class of proteins in the sarcomere. And these accessory proteins are going to act as anchors to hold the filaments in the correct position. Now, titan is the elastic filament that's going to be organized inside of the sarcomere to hold it together. But we're also going to have another anchor protein. And it's not throughout the whole like chain of sarcomeres, but really it's what connects up to the membranes, anchors into the membranes, so when the sarcomeres contract, they can pull on the membranes. Uh, and that's a molecule called dystrophin. And you've maybe heard of a disease called muscular dystrophy. And muscular dystrophy is related to the function of the stroke. So in addition to titan, titan will be one of our accessory proteins. We're also going to have dystrophin. Dystrophin. And so the dystrophin, this, this is internal to the sarcomere. And this is going to be the protein that links actin to the sarcolemma. And remember what sarcolemma was? Anyone remember? Great. What's sarcolemma? It's not the, the SR. That's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcolemma. It's the plasma, or really specifically the cell membrane of the muscle. So dystrophin is what actually connects all of these contractile proteins and regulatory proteins together so that they can actually anchor into the cell membrane and then it pulls on the cell membrane during short. Is that actin? Act. It's actic, but it's supposed to be actin. I'm still thinking about malls. <laughs> now with dystrophin, the link to act into the sarcomembrane, membrane, the link is going to be, uh, there's going to be another protein that attaches, that's attached into the sarcolemma. And then we are going to have, so dystrophin is the link, the protein attached to the sarcolemma. And then we're also going to have a link that goes into the endomesium. So we have the sarcolemma, and then we have the connective tissue around the sarcolemma called the endomesium. And we're going to link into the endomesium as well. So the, each individual sarcomere is linked together. Chains of sarcomeres are linked into the sarcolemma, the <clears throat> cell membrane of the muscle, and then the cell membrane of the muscle were linked to the other Linkage. All right, so let's talk about striations and really um, what accounts for what we see under light microscopy. So why do we see these alternating bands of dark and light? I'm going to start this because where do we find striations? We basically find striations in muscle. 
We don't find it in any other tissues. And you could argue, well, there must be no myosin or actin in other tissues. But guess what? Myosin and actin are actually found in almost every other cell type in the body. So it's not just simply that myosin and actin are present. They need to be present, but they need to be present in a certain structure. But before I move on here, just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of where we might find myosin and actin in other places and other cells, I guess I just sort of want to take this moment to sort of chase a little rabbit trail here and talk, what are myosin and actin doing in other cells? Well, in a lot of those cells, they aid in mitosis and help to divide two cells or one cell into two daughter cells. Um, actin and myosin are components of the cytoskeleton and help to provide some structure. The inner uh, cellular skeleton uh, provides structure for the cell and holds up the cell membrane. And then we also can use actin and myosin in motility. And primarily what I'm talking about with motility is actin and myosin are going to be involved in the biochemical phenomenon of carrying vesicles around the cell and taking them from the Golgi complex and delivering them up to the uh, plasma membrane, membrane to release the contents of that vesicle or bringing it back in. We're bringing in material through phagocytosis or phenocytosis. Is there a question? So actin and myosin are all over the place and they're doing some other really neat stuff in other types of cells. They just happen to uh, show uh, uh, striations in muscle cell because they're organized in a very specific pattern. And that pattern really is going to be the myofibril. And hopefully you're kind of getting a sense of why the myofibril is organized the way that it's organized. Uh, I'm sorry, am I? Yeah, this isn't supposed to have. If you're keeping along with the outline, get rid of that guy right there. If you're following along with this, you're kind of getting an idea why the myofibril is organized the way that it's organized because it's basically threads running parallel that can pull on each other. And by pulling on each other, we can reduce the size of the sarcomere. Literally, we can shrink this down. So I want to familiarize you with the molecular diagram. And what do I mean by a molecular diagram? I'm basically am saying, I'm going to show you at the molecular level how myosin and actin are organized to account for the striations. Now again, striations are being formed as alternating bands of light and dark. The molecular diagram for a uh, for a um, organization to form the striations is just simply going to be referred to as the sarcomere. S a r c o m e r e, the sarcomere. And we define the sarcomere as being from Z line to Z line. That's supposed to be N. So from Z line to Z line, you can also um, substitute line, can also be disc. So you could si simply say the sarcomere is Z disc to Z disc. So what does that actually mean? Well, what that actually means is 
When we look at it from the molecular level, so let's look at this guy right here. You can see that there are these vertical lines, and then you have sort of these patches of pretty dark material and pretty light material. These are the Z lines, okay? Z line and Z line. And those are just simply going to be those tightened proteins that are helping to kind of hold everything in place. And then extending from those tightened proteins, it, and you may have to come up and take a look at this if this isn't, if, if you can't really see this. In this little box right here, in this little box right here, there are very small little lines, very thin little lines. And those are going to be the thin filaments. So that's troponin, tropomyosin, and primarily actin. And they extend into the sarcomere, and they're kind of structured and held in place. And that's what you can see here in cartoon. Here's our thin filaments all the way through here. Here's one of our Z lines, another Z line. And we got that on the other side as well. And then in the middle, you can see that there's actually some thicker structures in there. Those are the thick filaments. Yes? So like Z line, it contains the elastic filaments. Because okay. what you're going to see here is this structure, I can label it, and I can call these the Z lines, and then I can call these the I bands, and I can call this the dark band or the, the A band. And then in the middle, I got uh, things like the M line and the H zone. So each of those are basically the names for those individual structures that we can see. Z-line contains the elastic filaments. The outer I-bands here, which technically is not only part of one of the uh, sarcomeres, but is part of an attached sarcomere. Does that make sense? So it's on either side of this is this is the sar this is one sarcomere right here, right? This is part of a second sarcomere, but both of these collectively on either side of that Z line will take up the I band. Does that make sense? So you got the I band, and it's the I band because it's light. L I G H T. Light. I band. Let me kind of draw some of this stuff up. So these are going to be Z lines. That's what you can see right here and then represented right here. Now, this whole thing, this is going to be, that's going to be the sarcomere. Now, I'm also going to have, if we were to kind of zoom out and shrink this one down, Z-line to Z-line, there's a sarcomere. Then I have another Z-line. Here's a second sarcomere, another Z-line, a third sarcomere. So this is one sarcomere, two sarcomeres, three sarcomeres. So this I'm just kind of blowing up one individual sarcomere. But we can see a little bit of this sarcomere over here and a little bit of sarcomere zero over here. We're going to have a small amount of thin filaments that are just basically thin filaments. And we're actually going to find that on both sides of the Z-line. So this is sarcomere 0 over here. Here's sarcomere 1 on this side, and this is sarcomere 2 on this side. This whole structure here and this structure here, that's going to be our I-band. And the I comes from L-I-G-H-T. I know I'm the I in light. And it's light. You understand why it's light? Because they're not as dark. It's more light permeates through from the lamp on your microscope. So you can see more light or it becomes lighter. Then we're going to move into an area where we have Are thick filaments present? Okay, so we're going to have the thick filaments present. However, 
as you're looking at this, notice that right here in the middle, it becomes a little bit light again. You see that right here, right in the middle? There's kind of a line in there, and then it looks like it's lighter. These are pretty dark. These are pretty light again. What's going on there is the thin filaments extend out of the eye band. Uh-oh. I got too many. <laughs> Great job. So now I have some additional here we'll do green. I have some additional things going on here. This is now going to be really dark because not only do I have thin band, but I also have thick band. So I got a lot, a lot of protein here. So from this line right here over to here, and then this guy right here to over to here, those are the A bands. And where does A come from? Well, it's because, I'm sorry, um, the whole thing, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, so the whole thing from here to here is referred to as the A band. And where does A come from? It's because it's dark. So this whole patch here is going to look dark, but it's not uniformly dark. We're also going to have this section right in here where it's just a little bit lighter. And that's what you can see here. So the whole thing here is going to be the dark band. So it's one dark band per sarcomere, two shared I bands per sarcomere. Right? They're shared because this is another sarcomere going this way. From here over this way is another sarcomere. Is everybody following along? This little patch here, which we're also going to find that there's a structure that looks like this in the middle. That's what we can see right there. So you have sort of pretty light around in here and then this real dark line. The dark line is the M line and these are just simply anchor proteins. M line and like it's my line. Whose line is it anyways? It's my line. So it's the M line. I don't know if that'll help at all. Probably won't, but whatever. So there's the M line, and then that whole kind of structure here um, where there's just the myosin filaments, we don't have any of the actin filaments extending in there, is going to be called the H zone or the H band. Okay? Is that where it like um, yeah, this is going to be somewhat of the bare zone for the myosin head, but what's going to happen when the muscle contracts, the H zone is going to decrease in size. And so this whole thing is going to begin to move in this direction. And so I can't draw it. I wish I had like so super it, problems it, here. It basically pulls the other one. When it moves, this Z line is going this way. This Z line is going this way. The, the what? The what? H zone. Yep. Yeah, all of this begins to, and, and it's like these are beginning to come together. The actin filaments begin to come closer and closer together. And in fact, they get to a point where they get so close together, they begin to slip over each other. Like top plates. And that would be in the contracted state. Now, if you start to think about this, maximal muscle power generation, I want to use every single myosin head that I have to pull on every single actin, and I want to move it as far as I can, right? So if I want to lift a maximum amount of weight, let's say my normal 150 pounds that I don't have bicep curl, to be able to do that, to be able to do that, I have to use every single myosin head attached to actin at some point throughout this contraction 
and multiple times as it kind of pulls on it because the myosin head will kind of grab on, pull it, and so the actin filament moves and then it'll release and kind of grab onto the next place and pull it and it's kind of like pulling on a rope. Does it not stretch back? Like once the head lets go, it's not stretch back. No, and that's a great question because it's not like all of the myosin heads are just doing the same thing at the exact same time. We may have a myosin head that's doing this while one is relaxing. One's grabbing and pulling, the other's lax, relaxing and recoiling. And so it's hand over hand over hand all across this muscle cell causing it to shorten. And as I get closer and closer and closer together and I begin to overlap, see what's happening? I'm now losing active and active sites that I can grab onto. Because they begin to overlap. And we're going to talk about consequences of doing that a little bit later. That's more, some more for, foreshadowing. So we have to cause the sarcomere to shorten to cause contraction. What do I need to do to cause contraction? Increase calcium. How am I getting the increased calcium? 